Welcome to the Wrestling Philosophy Show, where we discuss unique perspectives and beliefs on the sport of wrestling. Give us a follow or subscribe on various social media platforms, including YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Enjoy the show. Recruiting-accelerator.com. That's correct. Recruiting-accelerator.com. When you go to store, you can check out and enter the code wrestling philosophy for a hundred dollars off. Thank you, coach. All right, Wayne well, Martin, how you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, Jared. How about you? Uh, beautiful day here in Ohio. I can't complain, you know, so uh it's another beautiful day. I can't complain at all. So let's jump right in. You know, I know you're uh, tight on a schedule, but I think we got got to get fit some of these stories in. So let, let's jump right off uh, exactly. for the listeners that don't know. Kind of let's hear your uh, your start to wrestling and kind of your wrestling story. Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, I, I grew up in a wrestling family, obviously. Um, my father was a high school wrestling coach, uh, very instrumental to the beginning, actually the beginning of high school wrestling in the state of Virginia. They, he's referred to as a father of wrestling. He's right. the one who really got the, um, got it organized in the high school level with the, with the Virginia High School League. And we're talking about 1946, 47. He really worked on it and it became official in 1948 was when the Virginia High School League started the official sport of wrestling in the state of Virginia. Of course, it was kind of spread only a few schools in the state as that time had it. But as the years went on, grew it grew and grew in popularity. And eventually, you know, today we have 300, I think 323 schools in the state of Virginia that have high school wrestling. But um, grew up in that family. It was great. Um, I had four brothers and three sisters. All my brothers, we all wrestled. Um, you know, we were all fortunate enough to, to have a, uh, you know, a great coach and our dad. And then, um, and then we were, we were all state champions too. We won state titles. Um, you know, I won one state championship. My brother, Billy, the old, my oldest brother won two state titles. My brother, Steve, who was, a, um, currently coach now at Great Bridge High School, we won three state titles. My brother, David was a four time state champion. Wow. And so we, we kind of came up in that wrestling era. Um, my father was a high school teacher at Grammy High School and also a farmer. So we owned a farm out in, in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia. And so he was an agriculture farmer. We grew strawberries and grapes and sweet corn. And um, what he would do is, of course, he, he got wrestling started in 48. And he coached from 48 to officially 1972. Oh, wow. And he won, 20, he won 22 out of 23 state championships. He was second one year in 1959 because of a dis, um, uh, desegregation came into Norfolk public schools and they actually shut the school system down to protest the integration of African Americans in, into the into the schools they sh shut the schools down from September almost through December and about four of his really good kids you know wanted to graduate on time so they transferred to schools in Virginia Beach and neighboring neighboring school divisions and so he really had to deplete the team and he ended up losing the state championship that year by five points. Oh, so he got second that year. And so, and then he came back as, so he, I think he'd won 10 in a row, got second that year and then came back and won, won, um, won 12 more in a row, then retired. But during that time period, you know, what he would do is, um, you know, on the weekends, he would bring the wrestlers home and to work the farm. Right. And so that's where I kind of got, you learn who the, all these individuals were, you know, athletes coming to the house. I was a little guy, you know, eight, nine years old, not really knowing everything and the magnitude of the impact my dad was having on wrestling in Virginia in those early years. But what he did is um, he brought them there and he'd work them on the farm. And then what we had done, he had, he had gone out in the woods and he, he wanted a, a wrestling area to kind of, you know, to train the kids right. too. He, they'd work all day in the fields in the, in the evening they come in, they put about two hours, two and a half hours in on the mat. So over in the woods, he went over and cleared an area and dug a, dug like a little pit. And he went down to the sawmill down the road, got truckloads of sawmill. So we put sawmill in that 12 inch pit and he got a plastic tarp that he stretched over the top of it. And he, you know, we cut up tires and put hooks in them. No and we pounded the rims. And so we had a tight 
soft, nice wrestling mat made of sawdust and a thin mat cover. And that's what he did. He took the kids there and trained them. And, you know, he'd come, they'd come work on the farm, have a lunch, you know, eat lunch. He'd go over and hit the mat for about an hour and a half, go back out on the fields, come back that evening and do it one more time. And then Sunday, you know, he'd, they'd work them a little bit more and the kids would go home and school. So he did that several years until we got uh, started making a little bit of money on the strawberry farm. And then eventually we built a new barn. And so I was about 13 years old then and was starting to get into wrestling. And he would, he gave, he would pay us a little bit of money, us as, I, as me and my brothers, you know? Um, and so I had earned enough money, um, about $2,000 working for about four years to have enough money to buy a wrestling mat. Okay. And so we contacted Cliff Keen up at Resolite and he had a damaged wrestling mat at his plant. Um, and, and so we, he actually turned us under Resolite. And so we called up the Sunbury and I bought a damaged wrestling mat, a 42 by 42 mat. We put it in half the barn. The barn was huge. So we had a wrestling, a real mat then. Nice. And so that's when we really, we, you know, we were working out the whole time, but, um, but, you know, it was kind of cool because the, the wrestlers would come over, stay in the farm on, in the house with us. My mom would cook for everybody. And, you know, we just kind of went on and he, he had dominant teams right in there. So, you know, obviously I got involved in wrestling. Uh, my brothers were already involved. Billy, my oldest brother, um, he was a, again, he was a two-timer and uh, he went on, he wrestled Oklahoma State with Tommy Chesbro. Mm -hmm. And um, in high school, he was in 1969, he was a member of the USA Junior World Team that won, the, well, that, was, that was the first Junior World Champ, National World Championship that we had ever won. He won the championship at 114 and a half pounds then. He beat a Soviet in the finals. Um, and, um, so he had, he went in Oklahoma state. He ended up being a three-time All-American NCAA finalist one year, sophomore year. And then my next brother, David, who's a four-timer, he went to Indiana state and wrestled for Gray Simons. And of course, Gray had wrestled for my dad at Granby high school mm -hmm. back when he was in the day. And then he ended up, um, Gray ended up in, for his college career, he went to Lock Haven. He ended up being, he, up being, he ended up a four-time small college national champion and a three-time D1 national champion, voted OW, yeah. I think in 61. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he made the 60 and the 64 Olympic teams. Great. Day. So he started out at Grammy. He came up through that whole Grammy program right there. And, um, and then Steve, my youngest brother in, in the family, of course, he was a three-time state champ. He went on and wrestled, um, wrestled at Iowa, wrestled with Gable. Um, he was an All-American um, for him. And then, of course, when when Steve got graduated, um, he came back to Great Bridge because at that point in time, I was finishing my first coaching era and I became the athletic director. Um, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a second. And, and of course, then I, I, was, I won the state championship once. Um, and, um, you know, I was probably the, the least athletic amongst all three of my brothers. Okay. You know? So it's kind of funny because, you know, my dad would always say, you know, I'd be in there training and really wanting, you know, you're visioning yourself of winning the state championships and then going to college and being an All-American. And and my dad that whole time, would, you know, he talked to me about, you know, hey, you've really got to have your stuff straight. You've got to have your technique down because you're not physically overpowering and, you know, you're not a, a great athlete, but you, so you got to, you can't make any mistakes, Wayne. If you make any mistakes, you're not going to win. And so he was pretty correct. <laughs> he knew, right? So he knew, told you what you needed. I, to do. I, I knew that. And so, you know, I, I got in there and, and worked at it hard and won that state championship my senior year, which probably, you know, was a great accomplishment for me. You know, it's one of those things, you know, when you win the state title, you remember that the rest of your life. It's just one of those moments. It's, it's, it's kind of like a breakthrough moment for you. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Old Dominion when I graduated in 1978 from Kimsville High School. And actually, Keith Lawrence was my high school coach. And Keith wrestled for my father at Granby High School. He was a two-time state champion. In his, in his college career, he went to Michigan State okay. and read, read, wrestled with Grady Penninger. And he was on that 66 team that won the NCAA championship. The first time anybody east of the Mississippi River had ever won the Nationals. Really? You know outside of, you know, an, a big 10 or, or big eight school. And on that, on that 66 team, uh, there were five Granby wrestlers and was out of the 10 in the starting lineup. Wow. And of course, Keith was the 142 pounder. He was in the same weight with Owens and Gable. He ended up, he was a two time third place winner in the NCAA championship and George Radman 
who won the national championship for Michigan State that year. He wrestled for my father at Grandy High School. So we had, you know, Mike Ellis and, uh, you know, um, uh, a couple of other guys on that team. And then, so we were five starters, Donnie Cox. It was, a, it was a great program, a great team. But getting back to what I did, and I, after I graduated, I, went, I ventured to Old Dominion University because my brother, Billy, was the assistant coach there. He had two, a year before that, he had graduated from Okie State. Mm-hmm. And he had been picked up, picked up by, um, as the assistant coach. And so it, it was an easy transfer for me. I lived right in the area. I commuted. I was working on our strawberry farm. And mm-hmm. we kind of expanded. And we bought a peach farm down in Knott's Island, which my brother David currently runs. And he was, he's my, my second oldest oh, brother. Cool. And so that's what he does now, even today. So that's how I kind of got into that. And wrestled and was fairly decent in college but you know dad the whole time said you know you really want to get your technique down and how to teach it you know and uh, at, during this whole time we were always spent the summer at our wrestling camp the grammy school of wrestling right and my dad started that in 1966 and you know it is currently you know being run by my brother steve so i mean we're he's getting up there in years from 66 i don't know what's that it almost um we're about 54 years now that's been in existence so I was a good teacher. I would be running sessions at camp. You know, first I was doing small sessions with small groups of kids. And I think I was probably about 14 years old. And I was running sessions with about 12, 12 to 20 wrestlers. And then eventually when I got into, into college um, and got became the kid coach at Great Bridge High School, when I old, graduated from Old Dominion in 1983, you know, I interviewed at a couple of schools and Great Bridge was right in the city next to us in Chesapeake. It was a, like a very, very rural community, okay. um, but we knew there were great athletes there. And so um, I was fortunate enough to um, get my teaching job, teaching health and physical education and, and, and coaching, coming in and taking over that program. And that was in 1983, my first year. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd been teaching at camp for a while, but really had never been in the position of a head coaching position, obviously really young. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I kind of put in place what my I had been taught by not only my dad, but other coaches that had come to the Grammy School of Wrestling and during my college years, where I really kind of tuned in what, what their philosophy was and what how they ran practices. And, of course, how my coach taught me, Keith Rance, when I was in high school, and, and my father was always in the room with us. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of took that whole philosophy of wrestling and, and installed it immediately into my program. And so um, my first year, I think I took qualified two kids for the state championship, had one kid play six. I think we were 33rd in the state. In my second year, we won the district. Uh, we were fourth in the region. And that year, um, I had three, three state place winners and two, two kids in the finals. And I both got beat, nice. but I had two finalists and a third place winner. And so we ended up sixth in the state that year. And so, um, and then my third year, we qualified, I think, eight or nine kids. We were second in the state, lost to the defending state champions. We were bleeding them going into the second day of competition. I ended up putting four in the finals, the two state champions, two runners up, about four other place winners. And then that fourth year is when everything just clicked. It was all the work that we had put into the room, the drilling, the technique. And, um, and at the same time, my first three years there, or my, th- my second and third year at Great Bridge, my brother Steve was still, re- still in high school. So he was wrestling okay. over at Kempsville High School where my old coach was, Keith Rant. So my dad would be in my room a little bit, but he'd be over with Steve, you know, because he was the youngest in the family trying to get him squared away. So he would bounce back and forth. But that fourth year, we finally won the AAA state championship. And, nice. um, you know, um, I had five state champions. I think I took seven kids up. We put six in the finals. Um, I had uh, no four state champions that year. And, um, and the program just kind of took off from that point. And then won it again the following years. So when we put six in the finals at five state champs. And next year, we won it again. So it's the, two state rolling champions. at that point, right? It was rolling. It was yeah. rolling. We were winning. Um, I got second in 90. And in 91, I won the state, state championship again. And in 91, what had happened is that Steve had, between that time, he had been recruited by Gable. Mm-hmm. He went to Iowa. He was coming out of Iowa. He spent an extra year there. He kind of thought maybe he wanted to get into the college ranks a little bit. He was thinking about going to Carolina as being a grad assistant. Okay. 
And at that time, what happened in 1991, the athletic director, and I'd already, and during that time, I was working on my master's for an upper level administrative position. And so I got my master's in administration and supervision. And in 1991, the athletic director at Great Bridge High School, Virginia gave a one-time early retirement program. They would give you five extra years of, of, um, of tenureship. Okay. You know, if you wanted to retire, so the AD went out, he took it. Hmm. And so it left over the athletic director's position. And so I always kind of was interested in that administrative field. And so I kind of talked with the, the incoming principal about, you know, hey, if I take the AD's position, I like, will I have the ability to hire a coach? Hmm. And he said, yeah. And so we kind of formulated it that when I transitioned into the athletic director's position at Great Bridge High School, then I said, Steve, I want you to coach. Come, come be the coach here. We were kind of, you know, you'll be the coach. I'll be the AD. I was always interested in athletics overall. And so I, that partnership was kind of formed. And so I was there as the athletic director for the next nine years. And Steve started his coaching regime. And so, you know, the kids were very technically sound. And what Steve brought, not only the, the technique, but also that Gable philosophy of, toughness and you know hard knocks wrestling and you know take no prisoners and you know and so that the program actually you know really really elevated to a a permanent national type program and when my last three years there we were ranked always like in the top 15 top 10 in the country and then with Steve in the room with me running the athletics but also in there helping them and we brought in some of our old wrestlers as assistants things just really clicked That's awesome. and it just took off like a, like a rocket. And so um, he really advanced the level of the program to a national level. That's and so then cool. what, what, yeah, what my story took me then after that in 2000, a position came open downtown to be the supervisor of, of, of activities, athletics for the whole city. Mm-hmm. And so that was a natural progression in me to be a, a central office administrator. Right. So I came down in 2000, did that since then, seven years later, I, I became the director of student activities, which I currently am. And what I do now is I oversee five departments for an assistant superintendent, with those being athletics, discipline, enrollment, health services, and school safety. So I'm it's a pretty busy it's man. It's a big school system, right? What, 70,000? How many? Well, actually, actually 40,000. 40, 40, 40, okay. seven, seventh largest in the state of okay, Virginia. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, and luckily, because I'm overseeing athletics, it gives me the availability to go back into rooms and and still help, 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 you know, at student athletes. And so obviously my tie with Great Bridge, I've kind of been in their room for, for quite a while helping out mm-hmm. um, and kind of doing the same thing with Steve now, because Steve now has come back out of the collegiate ranks because he went on to Old Dominion. He was there right. for, for, for quite a while. And right. now he's back and, and he's back as a head coach at Great Bridge High School. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Kind of, kind of cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, we'll get into more detail on what you're doing now, but, to go back, you mentioned, you know, the breakthrough for the camp system, right? You started, yeah. with, you know, old tires and a, and a tarp or, or, you know, in the woods. Um, you know, what was the breakthrough moment, you think, for the camp system? You know, you meant we talked off air a little bit about the video and, and all the people that have been on the farm. Was there, in your mind, a kind of a breakthrough moment that kind of you, you shared, yeah. you know, for the program, for, you know, the Great Bridge great bridge program you kind of shared what the, the breakthrough was but for the camp system was there a kind of a moment or a time period i think at that point in time what my and, and let me tell you why we, my father actually ventured into the camping system because you know yep. as a high school teacher you don't make a whole lot of money and right, the farming right. we were making a real bit of money but he said you know i've got these people kept asking them you know do you ever do you know he he would travel around to to the to the around all these national tournaments so he'd go to the ncaa because he had kids in wrestling in the fifties, I mean, he had five kids win national championships, you know, yeah. he garnered not, he had nine national titles at the NCAA division one level coming out of Graham, Granby high school. And so coaches were always bugging him. Hey, can we ever come by and, you know, kind of tell us what you're doing. So right. that was like in the fifties and then in the sixties. So eventually he kind of, you know, he said, you know what? He started thinking I can put a camp together with all the wrestlers that I've mentored right. and they were getting into high school coaching positions. And so, right. Um, out of that, he started a, a one week camp and then it grew to a two week camp and a three week camp. And during this whole time, 
he would go around to, he would, we would never miss any of the NCAA championships. We would always be at the NCAA championships and cameras were starting to get in, coming into play then, you know, the old, the old, old VC, the VCR cameras, you know, before they had the eight millimeter. Carry the whole impossible. bag with the VC, the whole thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, that was so out, you know, you couldn't really get one of those things into a building because they, they weren't compact, but when they get, did those VHS cameras, mm -hmm. He bought, he started buying those cameras and we started filming everything, not only the NCAAs, but we would be at the world championships and um, um, Gordon McConnell, who was actually one of the national filmers for USA Wrestling, Gordon and my father struck a great friendship up. And so nice. Gordon was the official filmer. And so we would pay Gordon and he would give us copies of those tapes from all the world championships Dad would spend hours and hours in the home in the home on the farm studying wrestling tapes, not just the high school tapes or the or the college tapes that we would get. Because remember, my brother was at Oklahoma State wrestling. My brother David was in the Indiana State, mm -hmm. but he really loved the foreign wrestlers. And so, in 1969, when the Soviets came and wrestled the Americans, um, you know, so year uh, Owens was on the team, and Owens had just beaten Gable mm -hmm. in that classic match. Right. You know, up in, in Northwestern, he was on the Owens was on the team. Every American lost. And the Russians were doing what we call a Russian, a Russian arm to an inside step. And uh, we had the only camera in the place. No one was filming. And so we started coming. We came back and broke it down and started teaching it to our high school kids. We started doing it on a, on a high school level and our college kids would get working it. And so we taught it at the camp. And that kind of, you know, we, we started sharing that technique with anybody. And no one seen it Randy stateside, County. right? No one seen it stateside. So something brand new. Yeah, right? it was brand new. And so, you know, we will find, you know, the Soviet Union there, they, they were just so technically sound during that time period, you know, before the, before the, you know, before the wall came down and the country right. all broke up and the different countries and all that type of stuff. But, you know, obviously they've still been dominant along the, the whole period of time, mm -hmm. along with Americans and the Japs and the and Iranians and things of that nature. So, my father would just spend hours and hours every day just studying technique. And I'm saying he was getting up in his age now. You know, he had already retired in, in 72. So he was putting all of his energy into helping us at the high school level as coaches and wrestlers and coaches. And then also, you know, um, you know, preparing for the summer camps every year. Right. And so we had people that would come from all over the country every year. We got up once, once I think one summer we had seven one week sessions of camp. And back then the sessions ran from a Sunday through a Friday morning. Oh, wow. I mean, they were long sessions mm -hmm. and we had, mm -hmm. he was up, I think one year he had like 2,200 kids at camp that summer. And, oh. you know, and so he, he averaged a lot of kids coming in and he just, he just loved to teach anybody wrestling. He didn't care who they were. Mm -hmm. If they showed an interest in it, he would teach the wrestling. And one thing that he always did when he went to the championships and didn't matter what it was, NCAA's world championships, he would always go to those coaches and those wrestlers who were really doing well, you know, and he'd strike up a conversation and say, Hey, Woody, I see that you're doing this hold. Can you kind of tell me what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that, that they were all, they were all open. They would show him techniques and holes and he'd analyze it and ask some questions. And he got a lot of his, um, his knowledge that way too. Now by, you know, just asking, mm -hmm. asking and, and being open-minded. And so, um, and the program, the, the camp just exploded. Mm -hmm. It just exploded. And, you know, to be around for as long as it's been around, you know, you've got to keep teach good technique or it, right. it won't last. The camp will die. Correct. Correct. Right. And, and we've always been fairly fortunate, um, you know, to do that over the over the years, over the many years that the camp in existence, first by my father. And then Steve took it over, you know, when he kind of got out of the camp, he was getting up really in his 80s at that point in time. Um, and, and he finally got out of it. And then Steve took it over and he kind of formed a partnership with that and an old dominion to kind of run the camp. And so he's been doing it that way ever since. Wow. And so when you have a camp system that long, any, any good stories of that you remember oh, yeah. from any, any, any that stick out? Yeah. There's just all kinds of stories. I, I remember, you know, we were at the camp, at, uh, at, we, we had been all over Virginia in different facilities and at, at collegiate facilities. And, you know, we were bringing, you know, a lot of good college wrestlers um, with association with my brothers at Oklahoma State. He would bring his teammates in from Oklahoma State in the summertime. They'd stay with us on the farm and work the camps and things of that nature. And, um, you know, of course, David at Indiana State, he'd bring his teammates home. And Steve at Iowa, of course, the brands, you know, uh, Terry and Tom, 
would come out during the summertime and I tell you a story, you know, Tom was out with us and, you know, and, and, and dance and, and the farm that we owned, we owned at that time and, and, and currently do my brother still lives on the farm. My dad is, is deceased now. We, what, he what, had brothers on the, what brothers on the farm? Um, that's bro my brother, David. He wrestled with Gray Simons at Indiana State. He's okay. currently farming the farm. It's a peach, peach farm, great farm, uh, okay. winery. He does that now. Cool. But Steve brought Tom out, and um, Tom stayed with us for, I don't know, two weeks, maybe maybe two and a half weeks, went to a week of camp, and then we brought him back home in the weekends. And Dad dad had the um, these uh, Sarnese wrestling mats in the garage, and it was kind of like, a, like maybe about the size of a third of a mat. And, you know, we got a tape of, of, of Steve and Tom, you know, drilling and dad just drilled him and drilled him and drilled him. And Tommy, he, he had Tom show him every wrestling hold he knew. I mean, and Tom will tell you, he's probably never been drilled like that in his life. And it was great stuff that he would do over and over and over and, and show different setups. And dad would ask him to do it. We'll try it this way. And Tom would try it that way. And so he was, he was kind of putting all the repertoires together. And so it was, um, it, it was pretty cool. Matter of fact, Steven posted it not too long ago on, on, on his Facebook page. Oh, so it's He's out there. Wrestling the stuff. He's going back there? and pulling out some of the old archives. So my father had rooms of tapes. Yeah. He had, he had cabinets of tapes and things. Um, mm -hmm. And so Steve has probably been over the last year taking all those tapes and, and transferring to a disc, right. you know, Digi to, um, digitizing to digital them, right? now. Yeah. And so he's been posting some of that stuff. So, so oh, cool. that's always been a, been, been, been a, a cool little experience. And of course, stories about when the wrestlers would come and work on the farms and things of that nature where my brother, David, he was a great animal lover. He'd go out and he'd catch snakes. He'd have all these snakes in the, in a, in a pen. A lot of the guys coming in, you know, in the farm, man, they were, they were city boys. They were coming in from Norfolk. They weren't used to, wild animals like that and so sometimes David would run around and chase him with a snake and stuff like that and they threatened to kill him and those types of stuff and it was it was pretty comical sometimes but everybody all the all the guys that came out and worked on the farm and you know they respected my dad so much and their goal was this he told them he said if you come out work in the farm I'll pay you a little bit of money we'll get your wrestling right and our goal is to get you into college Nice. That was his whole message to all of the wrestlers that he had. And I mean, you know, he, he was pretty successful. He had, I think, 109 state champions over oh, his gosh. 22 careers at Grammy High School. I think they had like 76 titles. Holy cow. You know, you, you produce a lot of good guys and a lot of great, great guys. And of course, they stay in contact with you. Mm -hmm. years later down the down the line you know my old wrestlers that i coached in those first teams when we won those first state championships those are some of my best friends still and the funny thing is now that we are coaching some of their sons right are coming back and winning some state championships at great bridge high school so it's that nice nice recycling there of, of great athletes that you get that you see when those when those types of things happen Right. You know, so so that's what we're that that's what um that's what we're doing currently right now. You know, with Steve coming back into the program, you know, of course the goal is to get it back in the top twenty five. Right. To be quite honest with you, you know, that, that type of stuff. We were at a tournament, matter of fact, this past weekend up in northern Virginia, super thirty two one of those qualifying right. tournaments. Cool. You know, qualifying kids and to to take take them down there and you know, to have place winners in that tournament, obviously the toughest high school tournament in the right. country, I believe. Hundred percent. Yes, it's an unbelievable tournament, and so yeah, the um, qualifiers so, you know, themselves are turning into you know, yeah, mega the tournaments, right? Tough as heck. I mean, multiple state champions and weight classes, and uh, you yeah. know, it was a beer in the one we just went through. It did really well and qualified. You know, eight additional kids from kids that we'd already qualified. So you know, but it's to help the kids. It, it's what it all goes back to: mm -hmm. getting the kids to understand, hey, we've got a pathway for you and a and a career destination, but you've got to put the time into it. You've got to mm -hmm. number one, you got to be a good citizen. You know, you got to be great academically in school. You got to be hard nosed to learn the technique. And, you know, you got to be a model, model person. You got to do everything right in order to be successful. And one of the great things we do in our room, in, our, in, in the Great Bridge room, all the state champions' names are up on the wall. They're the only ones we put up there. We don't put regional champions up there, and the individual regional champions. We don't put district. Mm -hmm. You got to be winning a state championship. Mm -hmm. And if you become an All American, you get a star by your name. And so, and then on the other side of the wall, means, right? right. They, everyone knows what the star means. And then the other side of the wall, we put all the team state championships there. And so that's the goal. And, you know, when the kids come in there and they know it's a pretty structured program, but there is a pathway out to other 
other things to do. It can lead you to other destinations and open up your life. Right. And put you in, out there where you can, you know, provide, a, you know, have a career for yourself and have a family and, you know, be a productive citizen in our society. So, you know, that's what it all is about, about education. Right. You know, and kids make, kids make mistakes. We've all made mistakes, obviously, as we went along, mm-hmm. you know, trying to correct those mistakes and keep them on a solid pathway, you, you know. Right. hundred percent creates a new network. Yeah. Right? And there's always wrestling yeah. to fall back on. Right. You know, if you, you get off that path. There's always someone in wrestling that will take you in and help you out and kind of help you along when you need it most. Right. So, so you mentioned no your dad, you mentioned your dad, obviously a very impactful person, right. In and out of the sport. Right. As you mentioned, what are some of the qualities kind of you take from him that, you know, that he handed down to you, you know, maybe naturally or just, you know, cause you're doing the same thing. Right. We talked a little bit about, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah I, you, you know, I think I think early on, I think he, he kind of knew that I wasn't going to be the, the great champion wrestler that that Billy and David and my brother, right. youngest brother, uh-huh. Steve. Okay. Were. So I think what he was doing and he didn't and he was, you know, he was a philosophy major. Mm-hmm. He wrestled at Michigan State University. OK. And, um, you know, and and, and um, um, his coach was an, an Oklahoma State graduate coach, Finley Collins. And so I'm excuse me, Walt Jacobs. Okay. And, and he was from Okie State, and um, he got that philosophy major back at Michigan State University. So, really, in his mind, he was preparing me, I think, for the coaching ranks the whole time, and I never realized it. You know, I wanted to win a state championship and follow in the footsteps of my brothers and go off to college and wrestle and try to be an All-American and probably coach one day, you know. But at the time, when you're younger, you just are thinking about yourself and competing. You're thinking one day at a time, not 10, yeah. 20 years down the road. But what he stressed is, you know, your technique, you've got to have correct technique. And, you know, and, and, and we, we only sh- showed things at the camp and taught in the wrestling room. I was very fortunate. Keith Lawrence was my high school coach and he was technically um, amazing. And so that technique really installed in my mindset. And I, and I had to, and by being in the camp in the summer times and being in charge of those small sessions of wrestlers, mm-hmm. I would run little small groups of about 10, 10 to 20 wrestlers in a small breakout session. Right. And I, this, I had, I had a list of maybe seven or eight things over an hour period of time I had to teach them. And so I was coaching these guys. I mean, I'm talking, they were 16, 17. I was, I was 14 years old. Mm-hmm. And I was showing, showing techniques and teaching technique and running them through drill sessions. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, co- their coaches, you know, you, the coaches follow them around and the coaches are watching me run a session. I was 14 years old, you know, wasn't even on the varsity yet at Kinsville High School where I wrestled, but I was drilling the hell out of them, you know, and so that kind of, you know, I think that kind of, you know, prepared me early on, and that was the t- type of mindset that my dad, you know, did as far as making sure that I was technically sound, and of course, all my brothers were too. They were all great, great teachers. We could all teach. We could teach wrestling all day long, and of course, obviously, Billy went on and coached at, at Old Dominion for a while, and then Steve had that long tenure at, at Old Dominion after he left their high school wrestling and um and so that was a really really big thing and and as you as you evolve as a coach then you see other teaching methods and other coaching methods and conditioning and training methods that you pick up that was one big thing that I learned when Steve came back from Iowa well first of all my brother was at Oklahoma State he brought back a lot of great conditioning things that that Chesbro Tommy Chesbro was his college coach Mm -hmm. And, and so we initiate, I, I learned those when I was in, in college wrestling for him at Old Dominion. Right. So I took that and incorporated that with a technique that I was already learned in, 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 in college and high school. And so when I started at Great Bridge, baby, I was all in, the, you know, the Grammy system or the Grammy style of wrestling that I learned from my father and everything else that I picked up. And, it, you know, it just kind of evolved as, as the time went on. And so, one of the nice, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So one of the nice- one one of the nice things that we had at our wrestling camp is that we would always have coaching sessions in the evening time. We, in between sessions, we would meet with the with the coaches there, and we would talk about philosophy and coaching styles. And they had questions and how do you run a practice and things like that. And you know when you try to peak the kids, and so we would just share what our honest opinion was and right. how we ran our program at Great Bridge High School. And and that was for you and it was working right so right yeah it was Everyone working worked. they were saying you know i came in when i got hired at great bridge high school i guess i was kind of cocky because the guy who hired me i said you know what i said give me four years mm-hmm. i said by my fourth year we will win the state championship in the state of virginia mm-hmm. and he looked at me and he like i was crazy 
but he liked it. He liked what I, my, my, my philosophy was and my, I guess my boldness. Mm -hmm. And we almost won it our third year. We were second. Wow. And that fourth year, we won it and the program was, was rolling. And I mean, it was, it was just going. And, we were, and at that point in time, you know, there weren't that many national tournaments in the, in the mid in the mid eighties, right in there. It wasn't until you got into the nineties that, you know, we really had the beast of the East came open and all the Iron big man and yeah. Iron Man. And so when Steve came in, we started going to all those national tournaments. Mm -hmm. And that's when the technique that we were doing, you could really see it working on the national stage at the high school level. We were rolling people on the bottom and our takedowns were very solid and top work was great. And so um, that really promoted, you know, not only great bridge wrestling, but it promoted our camp, Right. you know? Right. So coaches saw those, these kids doing that and we would film all of our high school kids and we put highlight films together. And at camp, we would show those films one, one night a week. We'd have on a Monday nights, we'd show the high school sessions, uh, the high, high school highlight films. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday night, we show the collegiate NCAA highlight films. And then on Wednesday night, we show the world, the world highlight films. And so the kids would see everything that we were teaching at one night levels. Yeah. You know, one night working at the high school level, the ne next night working at the NCAA level. And the next night it was working at the world championship level. So by then they were saying this stuff has got to work because we not only are we learning it, they're telling us it's going to work, but we're seeing it actually happening in film mm -hmm. because that's what we did for years, for years, Jared. And that's how that's my dad great. accumulated all those copies of films and things of that nature. And of course, during this period of time, you know, we would have some, you know, co my brothers were highly recruited and Steve was, and right. we have college coaches that would come down and recruiting trips and all types of things. Great guys. We had, we'd invite Olympians like Don Beam and Rick Sanders. They spent time out on the farm with us. Um, you know, Bobby Douglas came down because he was recruiting my brother, Billy, at the point in time. Of course, G Gable would, would, came down on a recruiting trip. Now he didn't spend as much time with, with us there but he came down you know and, and met with my parents to talk about steve going there but it was just a proliferation of coaches from all over the place mm -hmm. and so um and and we shared knowledge and they shared stuff with us and it was it was just super it was yeah. a great yes. atmosphere to further the sport of wrestling and to gain knowledge and technique and share ideas and stories mm -hmm. and things of those nature so you know it was a tremendous environment That's i, I so just can't cool talk enough about it yeah so did all four brothers go to different colleges then yes yes so of course as I was Billy do you think that was mistake. kind of designed by your dad to kind of kind of see four different looks at it kind of or he just knew yeah. those are the right fit for you guys or I, yeah i think what it was my brother billy after after high school after he won the world, world title in 69 he graduated in 70 won another state championship then he actually took two years off and what he did is he went around and he went to iowa state he went to Iowa. He went to Oklahoma State. He, he during the, those two seasons, mm -hmm. he's, he'd go and he'd live on campus there for about a, a month. You, it's illegal to do, train, it. Huh? do it. You can't do it anymore. Right, right. You could he do it back in those days. It, right? Yeah. He took advantage. So he went out and he saw all the best coaches and he kind of, he liked Oklahoma State the best. And so he took advantage of that. My brother, David, he wanted to really follow Gray Simons because Gray was an unbelievable wrestler. They formed a group bond when, David was in high school and Gray was working the summer camps with my father at the time at the Grammy School of Wrestling. So David wanted to, you know, just follow Gray because Gray Simon was just unbelievable. Even after he had, you know, 64 Olympics, he was fifth. And in the mid 60s and late 60s, you know, Beam and Sanders and all those guys would come to our, our, our summer camp and train. And Billy was there training because he wasn't in college yet. And Gray, you know, Gray was now about 35, 36 years old. And Gray Simons was in the, you know, we would have our two hour sessions and then we'd wrestle live for about an hour at the Chamberlain Hotel up in the seventh floor overlooking Fort Comfort, beautiful place on Chesapeake Bay. Nice. Gray would go up there and he'd wrestle all of them and Gray Simons would beat the hell out of all of them. Billy Jr., Don Beam, Rick Sanders. I mean, all the, I mean, Gray was as good as then as he ever was, Wow. you know, but he was in the coaching ranks, you know, and, and he didn't, you know, he'd have his full of wrestling, but, um, you know, so so Billy kind of ended up at Oklahoma State. David followed Gray in Indiana State. Of course, I followed my brother's brother Billy because he was assistant coach at Old Dominion. Right. 
And, and I was really important to my dad helping run the farm because when David and Billy had were off to college, mm-hmm. I was in my teens and they were there. They were way off the farm and we grew strawberries. And so someone had to run the work crews and work, run the tractor and stuff like that because my father actually was still teaching at Norfolk Public Schools. Okay. Um, and so I would be the first one home. So I'd get out there and start the farming getting the equipment set up and all that type of stuff. So I, I had a close, close connection with the farming environment and, you know, and, I, and every older man offered everything I wanted educationally. Plus my brother, Billy was there. He was a great technician. Mm-hmm. I knew I was going to make games. Mm-hmm. And then of course, Steve ended up, he wanted to kind of get out and go to a big time program. And he was highly recruited. He was a three time Fargo all American. And um, you know, he, he was, was recruited by Gable. And so he wanted to go that direction. I don't know if my mom really wanted him and I, or my dad was kind of saying, are you sure you're making the right decision here, Steve? There's a lot of other great coaches, but Steve was set. That's what he wanted Russell Rye for Gable. And so that's kind of like how all of us got in our certain positions at, at, at in the college level and where our careers were. So you mentioned your mom, right? Obviously, the oh, yeah. wrestling family, right? Mom needs to be involved. Talk a oh, little yeah. bit about she, her. She was a matriarch, buddy. She was... Yeah. Um, Kind of like the glue that kept us all in the in the in a straight line in the straight course, and um, it was funny because m- mom and dad they met. My father was in the military and he was stationed out in Colorado, in Denver, Colorado, and he met my mother at a swimming pool. She was only eighteen, and she beat him across the swimming pool in a race, and so he knew that hey this was you know he liked her she's a good looking woman and very athletic but the problem was her her dad was the colonel oh. of the base and the and the and colonel um had colonel reaver was his name that was her maiden name he had desires of her his daughter not marrying a sergeant mm-hmm. somebody higher up in the military ranks it's so funny story what happened is that World War II. This was during World War II. My father's in the in the in the, in the army out of Laurie Field in the, in the Army Air Corps. Well, Dad didn't have a right a left thumb, okay. And because of that, he could go into the military, but he couldn't go into the trenches, and he didn't get sent overseas because he couldn't he couldn't fire the rifle, mm-hmm. couldn't cut the rifle back. Mm-hmm. But he was a great specimen athlete, wrestled at Michigan State. Physical education was going to be his major, so they put him. He was a master physical physical um pt instructor and so he trained all the all the marines of corpsmen who were getting ready to go over and fight in the war wow. and so that's where he married my mother so he was in for you know minimum three years and then he got out and while the colonel got stationed over in england <laughs> my mom and dad eloped <laughs> while he was gone because he wasn't going to say yes and so but it, they ended up, it was that, that's a funny story, but it, he ended up accepting dad and all that type of stuff. And so then dad wanted to always be a farmer and he wanted to coach. And his family was in Norfolk, Virginia, because he okay. was born in North Carolina. And so they moved back to Norfolk, Virginia, and he started coaching at a, in, in, in Norfolk at a school. Well, first he went to Woodbury Forest. Okay. Well, let me take a step back. Before he went to Michigan State, he went to Elon College in North Carolina, and he graduated high school early a year. And he was, he learned how to wrestle at the old YMCA down in Ocean View, Norfolk, um, and uh, because he was a boxer. And one day he was walking through the Norfolk Y, and and he saw these two guys in in a room wrestling. And he said, he stopped for a second. He said, he looked at it. He said, he couldn't imagine people wrestling. And so he took interest and they said, hey, we need a 115 pounder, you know, for our, our, the Y team. Do you want to come? And he said, yeah. So his coach, his first coach was Arthur Lowenfield. And they had a pretty good Y team. And they went, they traveled up and down the East Coast and wrestled like the Baltimore Y and all those. And they were good, good teams, guys that would go to the national AAUs and all that type of stuff. So that's how my dad got into wrestling because he was really, he was a boxer. That's wild. But then when when his, he had an uncle who was the vice president at Elon College. So he talked my father into, when he was going into his senior year, he said, come down to Elon, you will get you registered in your courses 
and you can start a wrestling team for us. And my father said, well, yeah, I'm not even a senior yet. He goes, don't worry. All you have to do is to take an interest exam. We'll get you in the school. And my father goes, well, what if I don't do well in the exam? He goes, don't worry about that. I grade the exam. <laughs> and so he went down to Elon and he was pretty smart to begin with. So he coached. He not only wrestled, but he found out they really didn't have a coach. So he coached the team. And it was, I think it was the only year Elon ever had a wrestling program. Wow. But that spring, what happened is Michigan State had a baseball. They did an Easter swing with their, with their collegiate baseball team. Right. And they came through and they played Elon. And they, he struck up a conversation with some of the baseball players. And they say, hey, man, you need to come to Michigan State. we got a great wrestling program. Come out here. We've got a great coach. And so he learned, he got information from about Walt, Walt Jacobs. And, and, and so he wrote him and he said, Hey, I'd like to come out and wrestle for you. And he got a return, excuse me. He got it's a fine. return it's message fine. back. And, um, coach said, Hey, don't come out here. I got, I got state champions sitting on the sideline, Russell in Virginia. You need to stay back. Oh, east. But my, no way. my dad took, he wouldn't take that for an answer. Right. He packed the stuff up, went out to Michigan. You Michigan him up State. a little bit more, right? He's got right. And, beat those and at this guys. time, yeah, Michigan State wasn't in the Big Ten yet. And okay. so they were in the, I think the Western, it was called the Western League, okay. Western Intercollegiate League. And so he wrestled. He won the conference twice, you know, got his start in, in doing that. And and so, um, you know, went on, met my mother afterwards. Well, they moved to Norfolk. And eventually, Granby High School had a had a PE opening, didn't have a wrestling program. And then and meanwhile, they bought a farm. And so mom, you know, she took care of all the books. She was a housewife. She did all that stuff. And um, as the years went on and we got more, we started the wrestling camp. She was the bookkeeper That's awesome. for the wrestling camp. She was a bookkeeper. She ran all the farming operations. We had a you pick it up, strawberry, grapes, scupper nine grapes, peaches, everything. And so she was the person who kind of kept everybody in place. She took care of all the financials and she did that for, for over 45 years. Holy Jerry, God, that's just so cool. unbelievable. The stamina that that woman had now, you know, my mom, mother and father are both deceased. Now my mother passed away not too long ago. My dad passed away in 207 and she, she passed away in 217, but those things, you know, those attitudes and those, um, you know, the, the toughness in both of them, you right. know, it just kind of trickled right down to, to me and my brothers. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the wrestlers saw that they would come out and she would cook the meals up for, you know, for about, you know, we had nine, nine kids in our family or seven right. kids. Our family was huge. And then you throw in about five or six wrestlers every weekend. On top of it. Yeah. She was, she was cooking stuff on top, you know, sleeping on the floor and all that kind of stuff. You don't find many women that would put up with that life. And I'm talking years of doing that every summer. Mm -hmm. But she knew it was critical to get those high school kids out there to help run work on the farm. Right. Because low wages. She saw the she books. She knew it needed to be done, money. right? She know, needed some so, hard workers, right? Rest, wrestlers would do that too, right? Oh, yeah. They were good rest, workers. You know, you know, most of the Wall Street, you know, Wall Street really comes after wrestlers nowadays. They like they like wrestlers. They recruit a lot of wrestlers. And, of course, the SEAL teams do too. Because right. of the mental toughness that, you know, that you and I and every, other, every person that wrestles goes through. I got, we got two kids right now that joined the Marines and, and we talked to them lately. And, you know, we said, how was boot camp down in Paris Island? And they go, it wasn't anything like wrestling practice or training. They had no problem getting through boot camp and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, th those are kind of things, but she was a tough old lady. Oh, that's so loved, cool. loved everybody, just loved everybody. And she was just tough as nails up. Yeah. That's so cool. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. That uh, definitely paints the picture, right? Having the military background and, you know, having parents from that same, you know, mindset, right. That, that explains, oh, yeah. right. You know, why the, why you guys were so successful and still are. So, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, what you've been doing for a while here at Chesapeake public schools, right. You know, director yeah. of student services, right. It, it's similar to, to the coaching, right. You're making an impact on, on kids' lives. Um, you know, share what you're doing now. Yeah. Well, I've been the a director going on my, I'm going on my 14th year, 39th year in the division. I came downtown in 2000, so I've been downtown for 21 years. In the first seven years, I was uh, a supervisor of student activities. We'd never had that position before. And so it was a position they created, and they kind of called me and said, hey, would you come down and, you know, superintendent then at the time did. He called me down and said, hey, I'd like you to, be, to, be, to oversee athletics for the whole division, everything. 
I said, oh, I'm very interested in that, you know, and he, you know, and he said, well, go back and talk to your parents about it, because I know you do the summer camps, you know, we could probably work that in, but, you know, really, it's a full-time job, you know, teaching, don't you only teach 180 days out of the year when you go right. to come down to central office, it's, it's five days a week all through the summer, so I kind of worked it out, and I was still working the camps from 2000 up to 2006, was able to do it, then in 2007, my boss, the director, retired. Okay. And it opened up another opportunity for me to take a step up the ladder. Mm -hmm. But the problem was when I did that, I had to stop doing the summer camps. Right. I had to, I had to get out of it. Um, you know, cause you're, you know, but, but it doesn't mean I could, I had to get out of wrestling or athletics totally for the city because I was in charge of it. Right. But besides wrestling, I also took over then being in charge of student discipline, student enrollment, health services, and just recently within the last four years, school safety which I currently oversee those five departments right now. So that was a big decision to kind of get out of their camp because that was a family thing at that mm -hmm. point in time. Right. Um, but I made the decision. I did that. I went in that direction, but I was still helping out kind of like some of the schools in the area and also Great Bridge High School. Mm -hmm. And then in 2012, what happened is I got one of our former athletes, um, Matt Small, to we talked and he was coaching. He had just won a state championship out in Virginia Beach at Cox High School, but he had wanted to come back to, to where he was from, Great Bridge. Mm -hmm. And so Matt became the head coach. And I said, hey, if you come back, hey, I'm going to help you. I'll help you as much as you want me to help you and as much as I'm welcomed into the program. And so we kind of formed that, you know, and I knew Matt very, very well. And um, we were real close, but we really got close after that. And so that's what I kind of had been helping him build the program back up because so during that stretch of time, there's about a six year period that we really didn't have a great bridge trained guy take over the program right. and it kind of fell. So his goal was to get the program back up to the state level. And so, um, and he, and he was successful. He won a state championship in 2017 and 2019. Nice. And then in um, last year, 2021, we really had a really good team, but we got shut down with COVID. Right. right. The whole winter season got canceled in the city of Chesapeake. So, um, so I've been helping Matt. And then of course, at that point in time, Matt had been in it for a while. He had had about 15 years of head coach under, under his belt. And what he wanted to do was trying to transition down to the middle school and the youth level. Mm -hmm. And Steve, the program at Old Dominion had got dropped because of COVID. Right. And Steve was looking to he, trying to decide what his next step would be. Mm -hmm. So it just all, and it just kind of evolved that, Hey, Matt wants to step down, Steve, you know, Steve's, hey, I'm interested in coming back. And so that's kind of like what trans, transpired. And right. so Steve is now the head coach again. And Matt is his assistant coach. And he really is dealing with the youth programs more because we're trying to get that cycle of wrestling. Because, you right. know, the, the great teams in the country, the top 25 teams, they not on, I mean, they got a great youth program. They got a great middle school program right. and they probably got a great youth program. Same so system we're trying to get through. that cycle going. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what, what our Steve's goal is right now as a head coach of Great Bridge High School to reestablish that chain of wrestling to have great youth coaches, middle school coaches and youth coaches too. And so we're doing, you know, Matt's training some young guys that aren't even in middle school yet. And PJ Newman, who wrestled for my brother, Steve, at Great Bridge High School, um, is the middle school coach. And so he's got that going. And so they all teach the same philosophy and the same technique. And so eventually, you know, what happens is those kids come up to the middle school and get more experience. And then eventually when they trickle into Steve's room as a ninth grader, hey, man, they're going to be well vested and they're going to know the technique and the terminology and at right. least have a mindset hey, this is what you got to do. And then Steve sharpens them and takes them up to the next level is what, you know, what the hope is. Right. And so, um, you know, that's, that's what we're looking for for the future, that happening. And of course, his goal, you know, I mean, your goal is to win a state championship and, mm -hmm. and to be one of the top teams in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, at the high school level, all high school coaches want that. And of course, you know, then individually for each kid to wrestle at their maximum potential level every time they stay at step out on the mat, to help them get through high school, earn a degree, and hopefully have an opportunity to go to college. And if they want to wrestle, great. But if not, just get to college mm -hmm. to get a degree. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they, they have a chance to make it in a very competitive world today. Right. You know, with this global 
society that we have and global economy, you know, to learn how to make it, make it happen and be successful, you know, right. and then hopefully have children that come back and hopefully if they're boys or girls, they want to wrestle, right. come back and move back to the area and right. let's coach your kid. So, you know, it's that, that, that type of cycle thing that we're trying to get reestablished with our program right now. And, um, you know, so far things are going well. We did well this past weekend at that um, Super 32 qualifier. And, um, you know, we're looking for good things down the road. The kids are working hard. They know the commitment level. They got to buy into the program. Some, most have been bought in, but, you know, some are still kind of, kind of a little hesitant. You know, they, they've got to break through that mental mindset. They've got to hit that wall and break through that pain barrier. And know if you, if you can't do it in practice, you're not going to do it in the match. For sure. It's going to collapse on you. Right. So we're trying to create situations in the workout area, in the, in the practice room, that they're going to hit in a match competitions. And that's why this sport is so complicated and so complex as a coach, because you've got to put your athletes, number one, you got to get them in shape. Mm-hmm. You got to keep them healthy, keep them academically eligible, but you got to put them in situations in the practice room with active live situations. And they've got to be successful in the practice room. If they're, they, they're not, they're not, it's not going to happen in a match situation. Right. right. So it's that mindset. And I'm telling you what, it's not easy to coach that way. Right. It takes a lot of focus and it takes a lot of energy. You've got to get a repetitions. My dad taught me and my brothers. He said, before you can perfect a hole, you have to be able, you have to drill that hole at least a thousand times perfectly, mm-hmm. perfectly. And then what happens is the hole, it moves from your front brain, your active part of your brain. It goes all the way to the back of your head, to your primitive brain stem, mm-hmm. where, where it becomes reactionary. You don't think about it. Muscle memory. When you right. feel it, mm-hmm. it just happens in a match. Mm-hmm. And he had all kinds of stories about great wrestlers that he coached that would get so nervous before a match. But he knew he had drilled them so many times in the practice area. He was one guy. He said he had to take the guy out and throw him out into the damn middle of the mat to start the match. The guy was so scared because <laughs> dad knew as soon as the whistle blew and they, and they, they locked up, this athlete, his guy, his athlete was so well trained. It, it's his muscle memory, as you mentioned, would take over. And that's what happened. And he just he was just one. He beat the hell out of everybody because he had been trained in the wrestling room. And dad shared that philosophy with all of us, my brothers as coaches, me and my brothers. And that's what we tried to instill. And again, it's not easy coaching that way. It takes, it's a physically demanding job. And that's why it's technically, you know, it's a technical sport. And plus, if you don't keep keep up with what's happening around you, you will be left behind in this sport because there are so many innovative wrestlers. Some of the best holes I ever learned was when I t- taught one or two of my really, really good wrestlers a hold. They come back three or four days later and say, hey, coach, let me show you where else I can do that hold from. Yeah, I've worked it out the last couple of days in the practice session and, mo- and playing around. They would come back and show us 10 times what we will ever show them. we get the credit for it, but we would <laughs> get them credit. And if, they, and if the wrestler did a hold that was done at, at the collegiate or you know state national level, mm-hmm. we'd name the hold after them. Nice. There you so, go. You know, there were there were holes that, that were named after people, you know, and mm-hmm. so it was it was kind of cool. That that was that's that real was, cool. That was thing. Yeah. So um so it it was like that. I've got, you know, uh, me personally, there was one hole that I really developed in high school. I was very successful in the collegiate level. It was called a Wayne's roll. Because okay. we were always great in the bottom. There was a way to finish up a bottom turn in, a shrug, a gramby where not only you would, ju- instead of just coming out for one point or getting a reversal, mm-hmm. I would stay in what we would call a back out position and work and work and work to get a, a particular inside leg and wrist control. And I'd come up and roll the guys. Okay. Well, I worked it so well from the bottom work. I think you would be in the same situation sometimes from takedowns. And so mm-hmm. I neutral, yeah. developed that technique. And then when I was in college, I developed how to come around to the front and crack back them down when they stood up. And I'd be in the same situation. And I, when I came back up, you could range roll or you could hit hunt, you know, kind of like John Smith type of stuff when he brought that in in 84 and 88 in the Olympic. You know, he's doing all those low ankle shots, which was revolutionary at the time. Right. But, you know, things like that, you know, and, and so we, um, you know, we advanced the sport. We would like to think we advanced the sport in a lot of ways. You know, it's funny. 
Jared, because you look at the NCAAs right now and some of those studs that get off the bottom at the college level, they're standing up and mm -hmm. those people are picking them up and putting them down. A lot of them are hitting standing grandies. Right. Now right. they really don't know how to control the wrist to get reversals. They just really want, want to get escapes. Right. And this weekend up in the tournament we were in, we must have hit, we hit probably more rolls than we've hit in a long time because Steve, we have been practicing that in the, in the room a lot to get mm -hmm. this team ready, you know, as we get into the beginning of the season and everything. But, you know, again, it just goes back to a lot of hard work, good fundamental wrestling and, um, you know, being tough and showing the kids what the goal is. And there's a, right. there, there, you know, there's a goal at the end of the road, right. you know, and if you do that, you're going to get good results. It's, it's just, it's just the way it is, man. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing comes easy in this world. Nope. You know? That's what we always tell the kids. The things you do easy, you don't remember those. Mm -hmm. It's the things that you had to work for over a long period of time that will you'll remember crystal clear 50 years from now when you're gone. When, 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 breakthrough when, when moment. I'm gone, when, yeah. when the coaching staff's gone, we're, we're gone and you're an old timer, you'll remember those days, uh, you know, back in the wrestling room. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool stuff. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing. That, that, that's awesome. That's uh you know, especially the part on your parents, you know, hearing, the, hearing how they evolved and how, you know, trickled down to you guys and now how you guys are making an impact on, on, you know, thousands of, of people's lives now. So I know you got to jump off here. Anything else you want to share with us? Yeah. I just think, you know, as, as, as me personally, as I move forward, yeah, I'm probably pretty close to retirement now. I've been in 38 years. I don't know. I'll, I'll be in this position a couple more years. And I think at some point I'm going to probably put all these stories together in a book. Yeah. I'm going to start writing and kind of do that. And, and my, my next path of growth, I'm not probably most likely I will probably as I retire, come back in some way, shape or form in, in wrestling, mm -hmm. you know, not quite sure what it's going to be yet, you know, to try to, to get back in there um, maybe in a camp type situation or club, something like that. I've got a lot of great, great um, guys that I coach that, you know, pushing ideas by me and things and having talks. So we'll kind of see how that, how that grows. And what when you want it. the book out, you got to put a date out there or else it's not going to happen. Yeah. I'm thinking, you know, probably, uh, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to pull all the little stories together and right. then, you know, and, you know, and, and, and getting a good basis for it. But yeah, it's something I've, I've kind of got a framework of it already kind of set up. Cool. cool. And well, so put a date gonna, out it's gonna, there. It's going to be pretty it. soon. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll have you back on to talk about it and, you know, people yeah. share the stories of, you know, a little bit, not too much of the book, but, you know, enough to, you know, get people interested about we'll have you back on. So, yeah, so it, it's, it's been fun. Hey, but I've really enjoyed being here with you this morning. It's a um, great opportunity to just kind of, hey, to, to, to talk about wrestling. Right. It's a great sport. And, um, you know, it's kind of like, like in your soul, once you get involved, in it, you've been right. involved as long as we have, right. you know, and all we want to do is just, just be good at it and share it. Right. One of the last things I'll just say, you know, kind of like what well, my goal is now is to kind of share the knowledge that my father taught me mm -hmm. and my brothers. Cause we're, like we're, we're, you know, it was a certain kind of mindset and a certain style of wrestling. And we're the ones here that we need to share it to the next, to the next young people coming up, 100%. Yeah. you know, cause if we don't, once we're gone, it'll be gone. Right. Exactly. There's a lot of great technique that we want to make sure that stays alive you know, as you build that kind of legacy and you move on in your life, you want to make sure that you, you and you know, that you do everything that you could, you right. know, right. that type of stuff. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing coach. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's time to start planning for next season's tournaments. Be sure you have Smitty's corner rugs on your mats to protect them and keep them clean. Get a hold of him directly at Smitty four, three, nine, five, two at Gmail. If you have a tournament, it's the way to go. It creates a custom coach's box so your tournament runs efficiently and keeps the mats clean since they use a top spray Mercy Killer. Uh, man, best thing to do is drop me an email, smitty43952 at gmail.com, or you can text me at 740-278-8016. And, uh, again, we got inventory, man. and get a quick turnaround time, and uh, our rugs are all top sprayed with our Mercy staff killer that kills coronavirus as well, man. So – you know, we were all we were already keeping it clean, keeping it classy before Corona. You know, now, you know, now, now you really got to have a corner rug, right?